So yeah, now this one's a little more specialised in that the people I was having coffee with this morning were all physicists. And this is really an astronomer's symbol, not a physicist symbol. And in fact, it's a symbol that's so little used in the rest of physics that actually when I asked them what an epsilon would look like, none of them could tell me. Rather less well-known symbol, so I've got to pull one from the Greek alphabet this time. This is the Greek letter epsilon. It uh, looks really rather like a seagull. It's kind of usually drawn something like that, and depending on which font you're using, it may have a little bar at the bottom. So that's the Greek letter epsilon, and it's used by astronomers in particular um, to measure a quantity called the mass to light ratio, uh, which is really just the ratio between the mass of an object and the amount of light it gives out. Uh, it's usually measured in solar units, so in these units the sun comes out as one, because it's one solar mass divided by one solar luminosity, which gives you one. But the beauty of it is if you took a thousand stars like the sun and stuck them all, stuck them all together, um, and then, then you figured out the mass to light ratio of that, you'd have a thousand times the mass of the sun divided by a thousand times the luminosity of the sun, which is still one, because a thousand over a thousand is one. So really measuring the mass to light ratio is telling you what something's made of. If I take a billion stars like the sun and stick them all together to make a galaxy, its mass to light ratio you would still expect to come out as one. We, when we first started looking at galaxies, I guess this, this kind of work was first done in the, in the 1970s, in the sort of mid to late 1970s, people start, first started measuring these quantities for galaxies and they were expecting the answers to come out about one because you know the galaxy is made up of stars pretty much like the sun and so we expected the answer to come out to be one. Uh, but when we actually went and measured it, that's not what we found. We were getting answers like 10 or 20 or 30, which tells you that there's an awful lot more mass associated with galaxies than just what we were expecting from stars like the sun. And this was really some of the first really strong evidence that the universe is full of this stuff that we call dark matter, things that gives out no light at all but has lots of mass associated with it. So, Mark, higher, higher numbers indicating some kind of diluting force? Perhaps? Exactly. It tells you there's something else there. There's something else adding to the mass that's not adding to the light. So you add a bigger number in the top, no, no bigger number in the bottom in your fraction mass to light ratio, and so epsilon gets to be very big. Does it ever go the other way? There are, so there are some things which have lower mass to light ratio. So for example, very, very massive stars, mass stars that may be 10 or 20 times as massive as, as the sun, can easily be 1,000 or 10,000 times as bright. So very massive stars have enormous amounts of light, and although they are more massive than the sun, not that much more massive. So they can have mass to light ratios that are a fraction of 1, 0.1, 0.01. But they're the exception rather than the rule.